All right. How's our audio? Can you hear me? Thumbs up. Cool. Um, the scripture today is Acts chapter 9, um, starting at verse 36. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon, a tanner. The word of the Lord. We still good for audio? Okay, <laughs> great. Um, all right, on Mother's Day two years ago, Trevor and I were trying to sing songs and play instruments for church over Zoom. I chose the hymn, Be Still My Soul, which was dedicated that day to the mothers of uh, Ahmad Arbery and to Antoine Rose. On that particular Sunday, George Floyd was still alive. And I hadn't heard about Breonna Taylor's death yet, but her mother was also grieving. Uh, I was 10 weeks pregnant and our two boys were acting out, throwing things around the living room uh, because we were trying to do a grown up thing. And our life was complicated, but we got through it. Um, then an hour later, I went to the bathroom and there was way too much blood. Just like that, I was losing a pregnancy on Mother's Day in the middle of a pandemic. I would go on to have two more miscarriages before my sixth successful pregnancy. I asked Aaron if I could speak today because my grief of the last two years has been assuaged by joy. This Mother's Day, I have a, an 11 week old baby to celebrate and her arrival, particularly as a girl, has awakened in me some latent desire to surround myself with the color pink and squeal a lot. It's very cute at our house. She's just learned how to smile. She squints her eyes so hard that she can't control the whiplash and kind of bobbles her head around. Um, it is a good time to be communing with the baby. But having a daughter has also caused me to get much more serious about um, feminism. I was raised with church words that told me that girls and women were as valuable as men are. But all around me, I saw signs to the contrary. Uh, women pastors were liberal and scandalous. Women Sunday school teachers had to have a male co-teacher despite their qualifications. Girls' bodies were clearly made for entrapment. So I'm working on addressing a lot of this confusion. And as I stood inside the bathroom closet during that first miscarriage and raised my fist to the heavens, um, the male God that I knew didn't seem to have a whole lot of comfort for me. Male God has never had a period or a pregnancy, a birth, a miscarriage, a desire for a child that wasn't realized. There were any confusion around children and what to do. Male God hasn't had to experience his body in fight, flight, or freeze mode every time a strange man approaches after dark or experience cat calls or body comments. Uh, male God has never had anyone expose his genitals from the back of a panel van on Butler Street in Lawrenceville. The extent of my Me Too movements are minimal, and I'm thankful for that. 
I know that the women in our community, many of them have experienced much, much worse. I felt like Jesus could handle my womanly pain because I could envision him dropping off a care package or advocating for my clean enough status in the synagogue after bleeding. Jesus wept and he sweated his own blood. He invited undesirable people to dinner. He stood up for the death sentenced adulteress. But male God, I didn't feel very close to. The story we read today about Dorcas indicates that her life was clearly steeped in empathy for grieving women. And those women were the least of the least in Jewish society. Without a husband or son, widows were at the mercy of their community, which we can tell was not a great system. Jesus has a critique that he entitles the seven woes of the Pharisees. And uh, he's rather harsh in Mark when he said, they devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. It was not one of his most popular speeches. The garments Dorcas made for the widows would have been a great value to them, both in their practicality and I presume also in their beauty of construction, uh, but also for the solidarity that they represented. The text doesn't indicate if Dorcas herself is a widow, but she is part of a sisterhood of women who are supporting one another and they are crushed that she's dead. A biblical scholar I was reading wrote that widow service special textual markers to alert readers that something significant is about to happen. And what I gathered from that is that grieving women are harbingers of the miraculous. One of Elijah's widows experiences the bottomless jugs of oil and flour when she chooses to share her last meal with him instead of with her own young son. Other widows have their sons raised from the dead. Anna at the temple is a widow and a prophetess who at the age of 84 meets Jesus the toddler face to face. And Dorcas dies and is raised from the dead. These stories indicate that God cares deeply about women, their bodies, and their thriving. So in my grief, I had to decide if I was still with God, and if so, what, what I needed to embrace that would be relevant to my body and my life. And what I needed was a woman in the Godhead, and since I've never understood much about the Holy Spirit, I decided it had to be her. So I started this process of searching for the Spirit, this womanly wisdom, this Sophia in my spiritual encounters and history and literature, and I haven't been disappointed. It turns out that body and spirit, of course, are not opposites. That's what dualism tells us. But body and spirit are enmeshed, intertwined, and we see them in feminine experiences that are holy and practical and profound. At my most recent birth, when my body felt more broken than it ever had, I wondered if I had pushed myself beyond an ability to heal. Lying in a pool of my own blood, I held my daughter on the bed as the midwives bustled around me. And I felt profoundly that I understood the words of the universal Christ. This is my body broken for you. As a breastfeeding mother, the parallels continue. Christ said to his followers, take, eat, be comforted. This is my body. And as I was uh, nursing my second son, I had the following words. Is this the feminine in the Godhead calling to me now in a way I can finally understand? This life death, this death life of the one who alone can be eaten alive and yet live again. The mother who alone can feed another and yet thrive. My hungry creature came to this life in a splash of precious blood. He finds his life in a most efficient system. My food becomes me. I become his food. His food becomes him. My bald baby revels in the ecstasy of milk. His every smile is for me. His hands batter me now frantic with desire. They will pummel me later in play and in, in patience as he must learn the way of gentleness, a feminine way. But what else can he learn from the feminine way? Roaring strength and a rushing wind. 
for our bodies feed the whole world, the world which we have made, and our spirits yield life forever. As I was having that first miscarriage, we were raising our first batch of baby chicks, and several of them appeared to be dying. So the heating pad that should have been around my abdomen was in the bottom of a chicken enclosure as we frantically tried to keep them alive. The houseplants were all not doing well, sort of dying, and the sourdough starter on the counter was clearly no longer alive. And it snowed in May, so all the seedlings froze and died. And I finally went out in the yard and decided it was time to dig up the rhododendron that had never flowered in the four years I'd been caring for it. It felt good to flop the bag shrub into the parking spot and shout crazily, I am done with you. And I was proud of myself for not trying to save everything, especially when the friend who transplanted it sent me a photo later in the season from her front yard. The rhododendron had flowered beautifully, a riot of pink. Sue Monk Kidd in her book, Dance of the Dissident Daughter, writes, until a woman is willing to set aside her unquestioned loyalty and look critically at the tradition and convention of her faith, her awakening will never fully emerge. The extent of her healing, autonomy, and power is related to the depth of the critique she is able to integrate into her life. I love this community's willingness to question and critique all that we've been taught about life from our varied backgrounds. The ways God has called us to synthesize our experiences of a father, a son, and a mother. There's nothing more universal than birth and mothering. Fathers come and go, but we've all spent months tucked inside the body of our mother, sharing her cells, her blood, her organs. Could there be a more analogous illustration of the concept of being hidden with God in Christ? The psalmist says, from birth I have relied on you. You brought me forth from my mother's womb. I will ever praise you. Whether your experience with your mother has been life-giving and healthy or utterly lacking, whether you've enjoyed motherhood or found it completely overwhelming or been denied it despite a deep longing to have children, you can know that God, our mother, holy wisdom, cares for and comforts you. I was at a party a few weeks ago holding my tiny sleeping daughter on my chest. And I was talking to the friend who transplanted the rhododendron. She told me that unfortunately it is dying. She keeps having to prune off more and more chunks of it. Her husband was standing nearby and he looked over at me and then all of a sudden he goes, oh my God, oh my God, she's here. And I had absolutely no idea what he was talking about. Then he pointed to my new baby and he said, she's here. Your pink flower is here, she's alive. That's why your bush can finally die. <laughs> My friend was really proud of his conclusion and I couldn't argue with him. Our seven-year-old recently was surprised to learn that grown-ups are sometimes afraid of things. I told him that when my mind is busy with worries in the middle of the night, I often repeat the 23rd Psalm until I can fall asleep. Uh, but I have a difficult relationship with King David um, much of his very celebrated life involved the subjugation and claiming of women and their bodies. So um, recently I've been considering whether the Lord could be my shepherdess. I'd like to close us out with a meditation on that and uh, to guide you, I'll suggest two images. If you're online, I'm gonna try to drop two links in the chat. Um, I've been looking at several paintings of European shepherdesses from the late 1800s. So imagine, if you will, a girl in peasant dress, her hair's braided. Um, she's in the countryside, green hills surrounded by sheep. You can also imagine a tall, thin Maasai girl, dark skinned, brightly clothed, surrounded by a herd of goats in a rocky landscape. Pick your shepherdess your setting and lose yourself for a few moments in the feminine nature of the mothering God. You can close your eyes, whatever makes you comfortable. The Lord is my shepherdess. I shall not be in want. 
She makes me lie down in green pastures. She leads me beside quiet waters. She restores my soul. She guides me in paths of righteousness for her name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. She is with me. Her rod and her staff, they comfort me. She prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. She anoints my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in her house, the house of my God, forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Mother Spirit. Amen.